Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Top 10 Tips for Physicians Facing RAC and Private Payer Audit. Today there will be about a 45-minute presentation followed by a question and answer session. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have a question at the conclusion of the presentation, please type your question in the chat function located on the left-hand side of your screen. Our presenter today is Deborah Weingard of Counsel with Watley Callis, LLP. Ms. Weingard's practice focuses on litigation and third-party payer issues, including the representation of clients in overpayment recovery audits, coding issues, contracting issues, and antitrust. She was formerly general counsel for the Medical Association of Georgia and currently serves as a member of the Board of Governors of LifeLink Foundation and as chair of LifeLink's audit committee. Deborah will discuss and review the top 10 things that physicians can do to protect themselves from adverse outcomes from medical audits. Again, if you have a question at the conclusion of the presentation, please type your question in the chat function located on the left-hand side of your screen, and we'll get them answered at the end of the presentation. At this time, I will now turn the call over to Deborah. Thank you very much, Melissa, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, Melissa left out the most important part of my bio, um, probably because I did not tell her, and that is that I was born in Princeton, New Jersey, and my mother was raised in New Jersey and is a graduate of Ridgewood High School. I've spoken to MSNJ on several other occasions, and I've spoken um, before um, the New Jersey MGMA, and I'm always delighted to be back talking to folks from New Jersey. I feel like I'm back home, even if this time I am doing the webinar from my office in Atlanta, Georgia. But thank you very much um, to MSNJ for this kind invitation to do this webinar today. And really, what better topic to do the webinar on than on the top 10 tips for physicians facing RAC and private payer audits. Um, I work within an organization called um, the Physicians Advocacy Institute, PAI. Um, Larry Downs is also involved um, with the PAI. And we regularly survey physicians for what their most pressing issues are with respect to um, the payers. And they have come back time and time again consistently and told us their most pressing concern is what to do with the audits. So um, that is what I will be talking about today. I'm going to be um, talking a lot about the types of audits, and then I'm going to be giving you what I hope are practical tips for what to do to avoid being audited in the first place, and then once you are audited, what you can do to protect yourself um, during the audit process. Like Melissa said, we will um, take questions after the end of the presentation. Um, so if I don't answer your question while um, the presentation is ongoing, um, please do ask your question. If for whatever reason I don't know the answer, um, we'll get back to you after um, today's webinar and get you any answers that you need. Um, with that, let's go ahead and get started. In today's environment, it is really important that part of any physician practice's business plan be preparing for and anticipating an audit. You just can't sit back and hope they don't happen. You have to plan as if they will happen, and that does protect you um, both in terms of helping to prevent them from occurring, but also it protects you in the event that you've got to defend an audit. You, you know, I'm sure, and the reason you're listening today, that audits are an integral part of all payers' operations. Um, there is a strong pressure on both governmental and private payers to reduce the cost of health care, and they view one way to do that is to regularly audit physician practices and to try to recoup any alleged overpayments. Um, the software that's available today makes this really easy. Um, and they do use software programs to mine claims data to see what codes you're billing to determine um, whether um, a physician practice is overusing a particular code. It's very easy for them to do, and that is how they target people for audits. Um, in addition, from the governmental standpoint, the um, RAC audits have been um, viewed as very successful. Um, in the last couple of years, they brought back 
$768 million to the Medicare program. So we all know that there are problems with the RAC audit process, and CMS even acknowledges that there are some problems with the process, but from the governmental standpoint, it's been successful, and therefore there is an urge to do even more audits. Um, there are contingent payments to the RAC um, auditors, and um, I believe that that does incent them to find overpayments. Um, if you look at the most recent report that's come out from the OIG, um, over half of the claims that the RAC auditors looked at, they found problems with. Now, those are both overpayment and underpayment problems, but the vast majority are overpayment problems, and they do get paid on an incentive basis. Um, if those findings are overturned on appeal, they do have to return them, but as we'll talk about later on, very few of the RAC audits um, get appealed, so that is a strong incentive. So for all of these reasons, um, you know, it's very important that y you view an audit or a possible audit as something that could happen to you and plan accordingly. So what steps can you take and what steps should you take um, before an audit occurs? Um, and if you take these steps, it does mitigate the occurrence of an audit and it puts you in a, a strong position to defend the audit in, in the event it occurs. And also, um, it does give you the peace of mind that you actually are billing and coding appropriately. Um, you know, even though you've been doing something for years, it may or may not be correct. Um, and if you take these steps, it allows you to look at how you are billing and allows you to see your practice the way that the payers do and, and puts you in a really good position to know whether you will be audited um, and that you are billing correctly if you are audited. Um, and if you can take care of that, then that does allow you and the other professionals in your office to focus more on what you want to do, which is the patient care. Um, we're going to be focusing a lot today on the RAC audits, um, mostly because the rules are more uniform with the RAC audits, but obviously there are commercial payer audits as well. And um, different commercial payers have different processes, different rules, um, and if you are audited, you need to become aware of what those particular rules are um, and follow them. Um, so. A lot of what I'm talking about with respect to the RACs will likewise apply to the private insurers, um, but the RAC audits are uniform as opposed to the commercial audits which can be all over the map. Um, the RAC audits are the recovery audit contractor audits, and I'm sure that um, you are familiar with those. They started off as a demonstration project back in 1996 um, and were um, viewed as very successful in bringing back money into the Medicare program. And therefore, they were um, institutionalized, and now they are um, nationwide. There are contractors um, that have been retained by the government, private contractors, in all the um, different areas of the country. And what they do is they um, have claims data in their systems, and they have proprietary data mining techniques which they use to um, look at claims. And they decide who they are going to audit based on what they find in terms of their data mining claim. So if they think that um, a particular code is being um, coded inappropriately, if they think that uh, physician practice um, typically don't have the proper documentation for a particular code, and they see that your practice is billing those codes, you are more likely to be audited. So it, it's not a random selection. It's typically based upon their, their data mining techniques. And um, likewise, the commercial payers use software, um, and they use you know, different software, but they are likewise looking for codes that they believe have been inappropriately billed by many practices um, that, that build them. And that's how they select who they are going to build. 
to Bill. Um, the RAC audits have recently been extended to the Medicaid program, um, and that was under the Accountable Care Act, and, and those are just now um, getting going. Um, the Zone Program Integrity Contractor Audits, the ZPIC audits, um, their stated mission is to find and pursue issues of suspected fraud. So if you get an audit letter from a ZPIC auditor, you need to pay particular attention. Um, and you know, they are only looking for areas of suspected fraud. It doesn't mean that you've conducted fraud, but either a code that they um, believe has been fraudulently billed or if they get a tip from someone that something is not correct in your, in your practice, um, that is their uh, mission to look at suspected fraud for Medicare. Um, there are similar uh, Medicaid in integrity contractors, and um, basically they work with the states, and, and it's the states that are conducting these audits. CMS does give a lot of support, um, background support to the um, Medicaid integrity contractors, but they are similarly looking for fraud. So. Among the RAC audits, there are different types of RAC audits. Um, the first type is the automated RAC audit, and the first you would hear that you are being subject to a um, automated audit would be when you get a demand for repayment. There's no review of medical records. It is just that data mining that I talked to you before about, and if they thought based upon that particular audit that a code or a series of codes had been overbilled, then they would put in a demand for repayment. Um, there are also in the more common type of RAC audit, it was a complex review. And a complex review involves the review of medical records. Um, it's very important to know that there are limits on the number of medical records that can be requested. And the, the reason there's not a number on this slide is that the number of medical records um, that they can request depends upon the size of your practice. So for example, if you are a small practice with less than five practitioners, then they can only ask for 10 records in 45 days. Um, and they determine the number of practitioners looking at the number of offices within a particular zip codes. So if you've got three different offices in the same geographic region using the same tax identification number, you would be considered as one practice. And all of the um, practitioners in those three offices would be added together to determine the size of the practice for purposes of determining how many records that they could request. And um, there is a chart that shows the specific numbers of records they can request on the CMS website. A semi-automatic automated review begins as an automated review, and then depending upon what they find, they may move it into a complex review seeking medical records. The difference being if you're in a semi-automated automated review, there is no limit on the number of medical records that could be requested. Um, and similarly, with respect to the ZPIC audits that I talked to you about, um, there is no limit on the medical records that they can request. And likewise, commercial carriers, if they are auditing your practice, there is no limit on the medical record um, numbers that they can request. So how does, a, how does an audit begin? It typically begins with a letter requesting um, the medical records. Um, I already talked about um, their reviews of claims data using software programs. Um, sometimes audits can be triggered by calls from either staff or patients. Um, but typically you would get a letter that asks for medical records. And you, know, you can get a request for medical records just in the course of business with respect to a particular patient, but you should treat every request for medical records as if it could be the initiation of an audit. Um, another risk factor for an audit um, 
can be your geography. And unfortunately for you in New Jersey, um, New Jersey is viewed as a state where, where claims are overpaid, which means that you do need to be particularly vigilant. vigilant. Um, on the CMS website, New Jersey is in red <laughs> um, because it is in one of the highest levels in terms of the amount um, found to be overpaid by the RAC auditors. Um, so for the last reporting period, I, I looked at this this morning, it was $852.8 million in overpayments. Now that's not just from physician practices, that's all of Medicare. But it is significant, um, and it's a 6.8% overpayment rate. So be aware of where you are located. Um, the most common adverse audit findings for physician practices are either insufficient documentation or in many cases no documentation. Um, and it may be that you correctly coded a particular claim based upon what the patient presented with and the services that were performed for that patient. But if it's not correctly documented, and certainly if there's no documentation, then it's considered um, not to have been paid properly. And that is a, a very common error on audits that can be easily corrected. Um, incorrect coding is also um, a high number of um, instances. And and typically, the incorrect coding is found with respect to E&M codes that um, there's been a lot of findings of levels 4 and 5 E&M codes when a lower level should have been billed. Um, lack of medical necessity is another um, finding um, on these audits. And often, this can actually relate back to either the lack of or insufficient documentation. It may be that just on the claims record, it does not appear that there was medical necessity for a particular um, code, but really that there, there was. It just wasn't documented sufficiently um, and duplicate claims. Another reason um, that's not on this slide because it more typically um, applies for Part A, but is um, the site of service. If an incorrect site of service was billed, um, there can be a request for overpayments with respect to those. Um, what are the audit look back periods? Um, for RAC audits, the look back period is three years. Um, under New Jersey law, it's 18 months. Um, but I do want to caution you that, um, you know, and we can talk a lot about ERISA and whether they, they really should be preempted. And I know there are arguments why it shouldn't be, but typically the payers look at and the insurance commissioners look at um, their look back periods as only applying to insured claims and not to ERISA claims. Um, there are also under state law exceptions for um, findings of fraud um, that the 18 month look back period does not apply. Some of the payers have very expansive views of what an appearance of fraud is and it may not be that you've fraudulently billed but they can use that that loophole to say that they need to go back further um, and have been successful sometimes in doing that. So now let's get to my top 10 tips for um, what you need to do. Um, tip number one, and this may be the most important tip of all, and that is to assess the risk of an audit before it occurs. You know, I've already talked about the um, the software programs that the payers use, both governmental and private payers. Um, but they are also looking at your data and comparing it to others in your specialty. And so you should do that too. And um, one easy way to do that is using um, the National Summary Data File, um, which is on CMS's website. It used to be called BESS, B-E-S-S. And I have found that that is the easiest way to search for it on the CMS website is just search for BESS and it will come up. And you can benchmark your utilization of codes compared to others in your specialty. Um, and you know, it may not be that, that you are billing incorrectly, um, but if you are 
billing a code a lot more frequently than others in your specialty, you need to look at that and figure out why. Is it because your practice is a subspecialty practice? Are you a trauma surgeon as opposed to a, a, a general surgeon? Or you know, is there something else going on? Is there something in the demographics of your patient base that means that you are treating a certain kind of patient more than others in your specialty? Um, so you need to be aware of that. Look at any outliers um, in your billing and, and see if it's appropriate. Um, but if there are outliers um, outside of your specialty, you need to be aware that that may um, target you for an audit. Um, you may also not be um, categorized in the correct um, specialty, and you need to make sure that the payers are correctly categorizing you. I had a client who was a cardiologist who was categorized as an internist. Well, obviously his utilization was a lot higher than the general internist because he was incorrectly um, categorized by, by a payer. So that's something that's really important um, to look at. Um, likewise, if you can view your utilization compared to others in your specialty, you may see that there is a code that um, most others in your specialty are billing, and you're not billing at all, or you're billing very rarely. Well, you may be leaving money on the table. There may be something that you're doing that you're not billing for. So, so you can look at that benchmarking to look at that. Um, another thing that you definitely need to look at is the Medicare Comprehensive Error Rate Testing Report, um, and that is likewise available on the CMS website. Um, and what that is is um, they do a random review of claims, um, and they look at the claims and they determine claims um, that they have found to be frequently overpaid. And of course, um, typically it is the E&M codes, the higher level of E&M codes that are found to be overpaid. But there are other codes on, on the CERT report that you need to look at. And if you're billing those, those particular codes, particularly since you are in New Jersey, you need to go back, look at your documentation, look at how you're billing those codes, and make sure that it's correct because um, billing those codes could target you for an audit. Um, you also need to look at your electronic medical records product and making sure that um, it is coding appropriately. And I've got a further slide on that later on, so we'll talk about that later on. But you do need to be aware that um, not all of those products code correctly, and that could um, lead you to a situation where you are targeted for um, an audit. Um, you also need to look at your, your billing um, practice software to make sure that you can accurately um, verify that you're being paid correctly. Um, and you need to do this as a regular part of your business. And then when and if you do get a request for a repayment of an overpayment or an audit request for an alleged overpayment, you can look back and you can be assured um, that either um, they are wrong or you can look and say, oh, you know what? This practice was overpaid on this particular code. I do need to pay it back. And I know that this situation has come up um, in New Jersey recently with respect to Horizon um, because Horizon has a couple of different um, fee schedules, you know, their general um, fee schedule and then their managed care fee schedule. And apparently um, some software products in use in New Jersey only allow one of the fee schedules to be loaded. Well, if you've only loaded one of the fee schedules onto, onto your software, and then you get a request for an overpayment for a managed care um, patient, you may not have the tools available to verify whether or not you have been um, paid correctly. So that's something that you need to look at. Um, you do also need to regularly review changes in CPT coding and payers' medical um, policies um, to make sure that you are billing correctly. Um, it does pay to be vigilant um, and, and make sure that, that you've input any changes into your, into your software, into your regular programs. And all of these will help to make sure that you are billing appropriately, but also mitigate your chances for an audit.
So we've already talked some about um, benchmarking, but it is very important not just to, for you to determine whether your billing is consistent or out of line with others in your specialty, but for you to assess what it is that you are doing and to make sure that you're doing it correctly. It also has um, profound implications for other payer policies that can impact your bottom line, such as profiling and tiered networks. Um, now, this is not a presentation to talk about those issues, but when the payers are putting physicians into tiered networks, they look not just at quality, but they look at efficiency, which is the cost um, of that physician practice. And they are doing those comparisons with others in your specialty. So um, you know, even if you never get audited, you may be tiered into a place that that you shouldn't be tiered at unless you've looked at those benchmarking numbers and made sure that they are correct um, and made sure that what you're doing is consistent. And that can come back in other ways and affect your, your practice. Um, electronic medical records. Um, a lot of physicians are trapped into thinking that, well, if the um, electronic record is coding it, it must be accurate. Well, that is really not true. Um, we had a client um, that approached us who um, was getting audited by one of the private payers. Um, and and her, she was a family practice. And her practice was targeted um, after review of um, the private payers' software. And when we looked at it, we realized that 97% of her E&Ms were being billed at either the level 4 or the level 5 um, level. And obviously, you know, that, that for a family practice is just not right. But her coding was all done by her electronic medical record. Um, she did not have anybody in her office reviewing it to make sure it was accurate. So we were able to negotiate with the payer in that instance, and she was able to, to fix the program going forward so that there wouldn't be the problems going forward. But that's just, I think, one extreme example of the fact that, that these programs are not always correct. So to make sure that you don't have problems in this regard, you shouldn't set these programs at their default settings. You shouldn't blindly copy and paste between records. So if you have a patient that you see on a regular basis, you, know, you can look at the past history, but you need to, to both review and then update it, not just merely blindly copy it into the record. Um, when you're doing the present illness um, for that patient, it needs to be based upon the um, symptoms presented that way. You shouldn't copy and paste from the patient's last visit when they may have been presenting with different problems. Um, the same is true with respect to the diagnosis codes. Um, you shouldn't just blindly copy and paste all of the diagnosis codes um, that you've dealt with with that patient in the past, but only for the conditions that were presented on that day of service that, that you're billing for. Um, and you do need to review the coding of your electronic medical system to make sure that it it um, is, in fact, um, coding correctly. Tip number two, you need to ensure that your billing complies with coding rules and relevant medical policies before an audit letter arrives. And you know, I have talked about a, a lot of this before in the other slides, but I can't emphasize enough the importance of it. Um, if you know your billing correctly, you're less likely to get audited, and you can also defend yourselves um, if an audit occurs. Tip number three, respond to requests for medical records as if an audit. Um, and um, as I said before, the most common initiation of an audit is a request for medical records. So when you're responding to the request for medical records, you need to make sure that they are complete. And I've got another slide on what all you should look for in that regard. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but you need to send the med medical records 
um, via a delivery mechanism that allows tracking, either overnight delivery or registered mail or, or something that allows you to track delivery. You need to maintain the record of um, that it was delivered so they can't come back later and say, well, we didn't get it. And when you can say, well, yes, you did get it. Here's the date. Here's who signed for it. You should also maintain a record of what has been sent. Um, you should also include a cover letter. I've had um, practices that just want to send the records without a cover letter. Well, that's really not a good idea because there may be questions. Um, the payer may want to come in and do a, an audit on your physical premises, and they need to coordinate that. They need to have somebody who is the point of contact for the practice, and you should put that in any of your, your cover letter, your correspondence with all the contact information. Conversely, that contact person should um, keep a record of who the contact person is um, with the payer um, and be up to date on that at all times. Tip number four. You need to determine the payer and the type of audit before responding. Now, this may seem simplistic, um, but it really isn't. Um, a lot of private payers hire outside contractors. And so if you get a letter from ABC Inc. that is asking for medical records, you need to find out you know, which payer that um, auditor is seeking the records on behalf of, and what is the scope of the audit. And that's really important not just to protect yourself, but also because of the issues with respect to HIPAA and only providing the, the minim, minimal um, PHI necessary. So you do need to look at that. Um, I have a client that a couple weeks ago got in touch with me. They had gotten a letter from, they had um, two logos on it, CMS, and then um, a, a company name, and they weren't familiar with the company name. And it actually happened to be a ZPIC letter, that one of those Medicare letters that is looking for fraud, so it was really important. But the letter itself did not say, this is a ZPIC audit. Um, you had to read the code and understand what they were talking about and recognize the name of that particular particular contractor that was the ZPIC contractor um, for the state. That was not in New Jersey. That was in, in Maryland. But it wasn't immediately evident from, um, from the letter that it was a ZPIC audit. Um, you don't always need to retain an attorney. I know I am an attorney, but it really isn't always necessary. That depends upon um, the type of the audit, you know, the scope of the audit, um, the amount of money at risk, a lot of other factors. But I do highly re recommend um, that you retain an attorney if it is a ZPIC audit, um, just because um, those are audits looking for potential fraud and law enforcement can get involved. So that's nothing to, um, to just sneeze at. Tip number five, pay attention to deadlines and procedures. Um, we've already talked about designating an individual, but really a practice should designate an individual before an audit occurs. And everybody in your office needs to know who that is. So that um, if you've got somebody opening the mail every day or different people opening the mail, um, they can immediately get that to um, the person in charge and and they can start compiling the records timely rather than to let it sit. Or if it comes into the hands of somebody who couldn't recognize, for example, it was a ZPIC audit, um, you would need to, to get it immediately to, to that person. And that person should then calendar all the deadlines. Look at the request and determine whether it, the request can be complied with um, in the amount of time or whether more time is necessary. Um, and typically extensions can be negotiated, um, but you need to ask. Um, and you shouldn't miss a deadline and then call up and ask for the extension. Um, and obviously document who granted you the ex ex extension. Put the time in writing um, so that everybody is on the same wavelength. Tip number six. Ensure that medical records are complete. Um, this is really important because um, most payers don't let you just supplement a record after it has been submitted. So if you've got 
um, you know, lab tests or other um, information that really should be part of a chart but has not yet been added to the chart when you send off the records, um, then you could be found to be overpaid even though if that record had been there, um, there, there would have been a finding that it was an appropriate um, billing. And that gets back to one of the most common findings being insufficient documentation. Well, you need to make sure that all the documentation that should be in the chart is in the chart um, before you send it off. Now, you can't you know, add things to the record that that weren't there or shouldn't have been there to begin with. That's considered fraud. But if there are things that were not yet included that should be included to make it complete, by all means, make it complete. Um, look at the records very carefully before they go out. Make sure they're legible. Um, often they're not. Um, if they're not, um, then you should type out, provide a transcript of any illegible portions, but label that as a transcript and refer to the paragraph or whatever it is that's illegible so that they will know that it was just a transcript. If the copies have taken off um, you know, a couple lines or a paragraph or, or whatever, if it's not complete because of the copying, recopy it. Um, verify that um, everything has in fact been, been copied. Um, this is not on the chart, but you know, if a particular um, document is in color and um, the color is important to understanding the chart, copy it in color. Don't copy it in black and white. Um, and even if the color is not particularly important in terms of the substance of the chart, sometimes other colors than black don't copy well. So look and make sure that um, anything in color has in fact been copied well. If there's something that's unusual, you can include an explanation or a support for it um, so that the auditor knows when looking at it why a particular test was ordered on that data service for that particular patient. Tip number seven, when used, ensure that um, a fair method of extrapolation has been used. Um, extrapolation, um, for those of you who don't know, is a method of calculating alleged overpayments based upon a random sample of claims. So a payer will look at, say, 10 claims, and if they find that a particular code in those 10 claims was billed incorrectly or there was not sufficient documentation, then they will assume that every claim on which that code was billed, um, that it was billed incorrectly. And they will extrapolate. They will multiply then to figure out what the alleged overpayment is. And there really is nothing wrong with extrapolation from a statistical standpoint if it is done correctly. But it is frequently not done correctly. Um, so what are the, some of the things that you can look at? Um, removal of outliers. Um, you know, if there is a very unusual claim, that should be taken out of the sample. Um, removal of zero paid claims in the calculation. Well, obviously, if you build a claim with a code that they determined to have been um, overpaid, and for whatever reason you weren't paid at all on that claim, for instance, if they found out that that patient really did not have coverage on the data service, well, you should not um, be dinged for that, and that should not be included in the overpayment. Um, consider seeking a review of 100% of the claims. Now, I know that um, that can be burdensome to a practice, but it is more likely to identify underpayments as well as overpayments. So it is something that, that should be considered. Um, now, the RACs are only permitted to use extrapolation. This is by law. If um, they find a sustained or a high level of payment error and educational intervention has failed to correct the problem. However, um, that is a really flexible um, standard. And um, once they've determined to, to use um, extrapolation, there can be no administrative or judicial appeal of that determination. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't challenge the method that was used or the sample that was used, um, but you cannot then challenge their use of extrapolation. 
tip number eight. Um, verify audit findings. Um, they are often erroneous. Um, and I gave you a statistic here. I told you earlier that the RACs find that um, problems with approximately half of the claims that they audit. Well, of those that are appealed, approximately 45%, it's actually uh, 44% of the RAC findings are overturned on appeal at the ALJ. That's the third level of appeal. So that's a pretty significant overturning. Now, very few RAC audit um, findings are actually appealed, but when they're appealed, nearly half are overturned. So, and remember I told you that they get paid on an incentive basis, so that should incent you if you get a RAC um, audit finding asking for overpayment to, to really look carefully. The first thing you should do is check the math. That's the easiest thing to look at. Um, the next thing to look at is whether an auditor's conclusions um, regarding the coding are correct um, or not, and you may um, look and, and decide that they are wrong, and they frequently are wrong. Um, and in that event, you really should challenge it. You know, a lot of physician practices, particularly small practices, um, if they get an audit finding asking for an overpayment amount, it's just easier to pay the check. But, you know, think about that. If you pay the check, and you think you were right, and you continue billing the same way you've been billing, then you're going to get audited again, and you're going to get a request for overpayment again. So you should seriously consider challenging whenever you think that there has been a problem. Um, you can also challenge the extrapolation uh, methodology, as I was just talking about. Um, when you're reviewing any request um, for an overpayment, you need to look at them objectively. It's really easy to get emotional about this, particularly if they're asking asking for a large sum of money. But you do need to look at them objectively and, um, and make sure that, in fact, you have been billing correctly and that your documents are in order. Tip number nine, understand your appellate rights and appeal any erroneous um, adverse findings. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the RAC um, audit appeals. But the different commercial payers do have different processes. So you need to find out. The bigger payers do have them on their websites, or you can talk to your provider um, rep. But um, smaller payers, it can be a little harder to find that out. But you do need to find out what their process is, what it entails, what the dates are, and make sure to timely appeal any erroneous adverse findings. Because if you don't timely appeal, then um, you may lose your opportunity. So let's talk about um, the RAC audit appeals um, for a few minutes. The RACs do have a five-level uh, appeals process. And this, I put this on the slide because it highlights the importance of understanding the processes. And if you look you know, at what the law says, you have 120 days from the date of getting um, a RAC demand for um, an overpayment um, request to file your first level of appeal. Well, that's great, except for unless you appeal in the first 30 days, you will be subject to an automatic recoupment. Um, so if you are planning to appeal um, and you think that you've got a good case, and remember I said nearly half of those RAC findings are overturned at the third level of appeal, you should be appealing it in the first 30 days so that you don't get um, automatically recouped. The RAC audit process does allow for informal discussions, and I generally recommend that you take advantage of that period. It doesn't stay any deadlines, but it does allow you to learn more about the RAC's thinking process, and it may allow you to explain what it is your practice is doing or, or, or you know, further address the issue, and you can take care of it that way. So um, here are the statistics. 90, the specific statistics, 94% of RAC findings are not appealed, but of those, 44% are um, reversed at the ALJ level, which is really the first independent level. Um, I do want to leave time for questioning, so, and I'm running out of time. So you can look at these slides um, later. But he, this goes through the, uh, the, all five of the RAC appeal levels. 
Um, and so you can see where they go to. And the time periods run from the last received decision. So that's an important date for you to be calendaring. Tip number 10, change any identified issues with coding and billing. Um, and this gets back to my advice to look at any audit finding objectively and determine whether, in fact, there are any problems. Um, and if there are genuine, genuine issues in either your coding or your documentation, then you need to correct those problems. And um, if you do, that really can go a long way with the payers in terms of taking you off their list to be audited in the future. And in terms of negotiating a payment plan if necessary. And payers are often open to negotiate payment plans over time. You know, generally, the shorter um, time period that you're looking for, the easier it is to negotiate a plan. A lot of physicians, and I, I've seen this several times, they will um, negotiate and get a good payment plan, and they say, you know what, I would just rather pay it all now and be done with it, and just go ahead and pay all in one lump sum. But you do have the opportunity to negotiate if you feel that, that you need to do it based upon the cash flow at your process, at, at your practice. So here is my contact information. Um, another resource that I highly recommend to you is a white paper that was um, published by the Physicians Advocacy Institute, that um, organization that I mentioned before that MSNJ is involved in, that I'm involved in. I was involved in writing that paper. And it may be on MSNJ's um, website. It is on the HMOSettlements.com website. And it's simply a white paper on medical audits, what physicians need to know. All right, well that comes to the end of my presentation, and I think I have left enough time for questions. Um, and I see some questions have come in, and MSNJ is going to um, moderate the questions. Hi, Deborah. This is Amanda. We do Hi, Amanda. have a couple questions that have come in, as you said. Uh, the first is, are there any records that should not be sent when a payer requests medical records, such as labs that were not performed in-house or records of services that were provided by other physicians outside of the practice? No, you should include all of those records. Absolutely, you should include all of those records. Okay. And our second question is, if the payer requests records for a patient that was treated at the office who is also seen at the hospital, should the hospital notes also be sent? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I don't see any other questions. If you do have questions, please feel free to submit them through our chat function. Uh, we'll give one or two more minutes to submit questions, and if there aren't any others, then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Deborah, it's Melinda. I wanted to just um, chat for a second about something that comes up a lot. Um, in the old days, we got very broad audit requests, and you really couldn't tell who the auditor was acting on behalf of. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's improved quite a bit. It has. You don't get away with that anymore. But it's still not always obvious what kind of audit it is and, and the allowed scope of the audit. You talked about that already. Um, and recommended that, that you try to get clarification on that, which of course we agree with. But one of the things that we found is that sometimes that really doesn't sit well with, when you're asking, you know, on what authority the audit is being conducted. Do you have any particular magic or, or advice for how practices should do that? I, I assume it should always be in writing, I, I, I think. But, but do you differ with me on that? Do you think that they should call? Sometimes there is a number. Or um, how, how should it be handled so that you don't escalate a matter? Well, actually, I, I'm not adverse to calling as long as you follow it up with a letter. You know, consistent with our conversation of you know, December the 4th, 2013, I understand that you are auditing on behalf of X payer, et, et, et cetera. But I really am not, especially if they do have a name and number on the letter, um, there's no problem with calling as long as you confirm it in writing. And you know, one, one sort of trick to make it more palatable, because I, I know sometimes that you can get people bristle when you 
try to challenge their authority, but remind them of your HIPAA obligations. Right. And, and therefore, you know, it's really important to protect both you and the auditor. Right. Like I say, I think the letters are getting much better. And they no, no, they really are. They really are. Well, it looks like that's all of the questions that we had for today. Um, if you do have a question, you can obviously email MS and J or Deborah. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask one more question. Oh, Deborah, <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> it's Melinda because this is another difficult thing to counsel on, and um, and maybe I'd like to hear it from another uh, person. But you did talk before about the idea of just paying mm -hmm. when when you get a request, and, and we've seen a lot of those, and it's very tempting if you've got a, a request for overpayment that's $400,000, and if you start talking to them and negotiating with them and they say, oh, well, okay, we'll take 100000 it's very appealing to a practice just to cut the check for $100,000 and walk away. But if, if they really haven't come to a meeting of minds on you know, what was being coded or billed incorrectly, then they're going to be in a lot of trouble, as you say, when they go back to their old ways. So I was wondering if you could just talk about that for a minute, the downside of just, you know, kind of being sucked into um, 10 cents on the dollar, so to speak, and, and walking away from the underlying coding and billing issues. Well, well that's right. And th that is the downside. And remember that in terms of the private payers, the private payers are all using generally the same software, the STARS software that's mentioned on, on the slides. And so if one payer has decided to audit your practice based upon the review um, of that software of your claims um, and identified a problem, and if you just negotiate on a number without talking about you know, why you were billing the way you were billing if you believe you were billing correctly, or why you were using the documents you were using, the documentation. Um, if you, as you said, Melinda, unless you get to a meeting of the minds, you could pay that $100,000 back. And then the next month get a similar request for overpayment from another private payer using that same software. So um, therefore, um, it is really important um, that you come to um, a meeting of the minds. And it could be, and I, I've seen this situation where um, you know, physicians are using their electronic health record to, to insert the codes, and then when they get the audit request and they realize, oh yes, that that wasn't correct, and they they fix the billing or fix the coding, um, it puts them in a lot better position to negotiate a um, a reduced amount to pay back to the payer because the payer understands that you've taken proactive um, steps. But I don't recommend negotiation strictly on dollars if you believe that they're wrong, or just paying whatever that they've asked. And I've even seen doctors that well, if it's a really small amount, just go ahead and write the check without even looking Well, you need to be looking. Thanks. And, and I see uh, another question that just came up on HIPAA, and this is really important. No, you're not violating HIPAA by sending the records. Uh, remember, you know, records that need to be used in, in, in terms of getting paid, you know, that is a legitimate use of PHI. But there's also a requirement that, that um, covered entities provide the minimal, minimal necessary. So that's why it's just important for you to, to ascertain that in fact a contractor that you can't tell on whose behalf they're acting um, really is acting on behalf of a particular payer so that you can feel um, assured when you send those records. But it's, it's not against HIPAA to send the records. And the last question is whether a copy of the slides will be sent out. And yes, they will. Uh, after the webinar, a recording along with the slides will be sent to all registrants. Okay. 
That's it. So thank you again, Deborah, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for participating. Right. Thank you, everyone. I hope this was helpful for you. Thanks, Deborah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Please stand by.